Greetings, humans. By the time you leave today, you will walk away with three concrete steps that you can take to better assess your own privilege, to be more self-aware in your interactions with others, and to generally level up in your collaboration within your company, your project, or within your team. So as we start down the path of this journey, I'm going to tell you how I first learned to understand my own privilege and began my reckoning with hard things. I'm going to tell you the story of how I learned about racism. So I grew up in Woodside, California, and I attended school in the neighboring town of Portola Valley. And for those of you who know a great deal about Silicon Valley, those words probably mean a lot to you. For those of you who may be less familiar, uh, I grew up in an area that was almost exclusively white, uh, very, very economically affluent, and almost everyone there worked in the technology industry. And yet when I look at the community in which I grew up, that was very much focused around my church. And that was a completely different story. We had people there of all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all ages. And as part of my participation in the church, I became fast friends with a young woman by the name of Adonis Williams. Uh, and Adonis was a, a lovely individual, uh, very tall, very graceful, champion roller skater, um, incredibly intelligent, very articulate. Though if I were to praise her greatest virtue, it was definitely her patience for the many times she encouraged me to a, attempt to commit roller skating yet again as a clumsy young nerd girl, uh, failing miserably each time. And to use her own words, Adonis was a black girl. So one day, we were out on a play date, as you do, in my backyard, and she fell and she skinned her knee. So I trotted into the house, and I returned with this for her. And I watched as she tore open the paper, removed the adhesive backing, and as she applied this strip of plastic and fabric to her knee. And I just stared because something was horribly, horribly wrong, but I didn't quite know what it was. And then it hit me, and I said, Adonis, I am so sorry. We don't have your Band-Aids. What was I thinking? You know what, no worries. I'm going to go to the store with my mom, and the next time you come over, every time you come to play, from now on, we will have your Band-Aids. And that was when she looked at me, and she explained that they don't make Band-Aids for her. This, my friends, is an example of a systemic problem. And the reason that systemic problems are so difficult and so insidious is because when you are a participant in a system, when you are a user of a system, and all of the defaults are configured to work for you out of the box, it never occurs to you that those defaults even exist, or to question them, or to adjust them, or how those defaults may be suboptimal for other people. And this is what a systemic problem looks like in terms of diversity in our technical communities. Here we have hard data, and kudos to my former employer, Google, for being the first folks to release these metrics about the makeup of their technical staff. The picture is bleak, but I truly believe that without transparency, we cannot begin to solve this problem. On top of data, we have science, um, the saddest thing about the statistic is I didn't even have to work to bring it to you. Um, this is just what is making the rounds on Twitter right now. And if you're one of those folks who best rocks problems by reading through scientific literature, I guarantee you that there is a large corpus of data available about exclusionary behavior and discrimination in the technology industry against women, people of color, people who are transgendered, people with physical disabilities, mental health issues, etc. And against the backdrop of our data and our science, we have the recently articulated lived experience of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of women in the technology industry and beyond about their daily existence with domestic violence, street harassment, etc. So as we grapple with these hard things and being participants in a system that causes damage to some when we wish it did not, we have to remember that the only component in that system that we can change is ourselves. So, as I mentioned, there will be three experiments. I'd like us all, if you're interested in participating in these experiments, to share your experience. We have a hashtag. How to for hard things was a little long, so we're just going with 
HDHD. And let us begin with our experiments. Experiment number one, I'm going to call this beginner level, easy to access, practice active listening. And when I say practice active listening, I'm not referring to the technique of mirroring someone's expression during dialogue. I'm actually suggesting that you spend a lot of your time online learning about perspectives from people who are not like you, but who care passionately about the things that you do. So the tool that I use for this is Twitter. I follow many people who are not like me, women of color, people who are transgendered, people who are differently abled, who care about things that I do like software development, sustainable agriculture, alternative building methods. And it has been shocking to me what I have learned not only about their daily lived experience and how it differs from mine, but also the things that I have learned about the things that I care passionately about simply by viewing it through the lens of their perspective, which has brought me insights I never would have had on my own. I cannot stress enough the listening part. Your job is not to interact. It is not to refute. It is not to support. It is not to retweet. It is not to provide commentary. Your sole job is to listen and to see what you can learn as part of that process of actively listening to these other voices and perspectives. Experiment number two, this is a little bit tougher. Change your speech. We have a lot of default assumptions in the way we talk, and these can actually be exclusionary. You've noticed that I greeted you with using the word humans, and I got a couple of laughs, which I appreciate. I very deliberately choose the term humans instead of everyone or folks, and I do that for two reasons. The first is, that's my reminder to myself that I am a human and that I need to practice humanity and be humane and compassionate in my interactions with other people and also with myself. But much more than that, I choose that word deliberately because it absolutely challenges the status quo regarding which words we choose when we talk to one another. I don't want to bias the results of your experiment, but my hypothesis is that this will be a very uncomfortable process for you, that when you choose to use different defaults in your speech, different terms, people will push back on you, and it will be uncomfortable. And at that point, I urge you to consider that for those of us in our community who are underrepresented groups, while we may be able to opt out of this experiment and say, no more, we're done with the discomfort, they never get to opt out. They will challenge the default by their very existence every day of their lives. And that discomfort is not something they can simply walk away from. Experiment number three, speak up for others. This one's tough. If you see something, say something. Um, I am, I'm certainly not a fan of confrontation and uh, like many of you in the audience, I'm a bit socially awkward. So when I see something that is, is suboptimal or problematic, I do try very hard to make a statement about it in public tactfully, with mutual respect, and with love, but I can't always do that. So if you find that that's not where you're at with your experiment, that's fine. But taking the time to say something in private is very important at the very least. For example, I know you did not mean it when you said that code was lame, but I'd like you to understand that that word is a slur against people with physical disabilities. And when we say things like that, what we're actually saying is, we do not approve of people who are different than we are. They are less than. They are not welcome. They are other. And I know that that's not the environment we want to create for us to collaborate within. So when I find myself using that default word, I've switched out now, I have my work around, now I say ungroovy. And I want you to please speak up and tell me when I make these mistakes because I will keep making them over and over again because of the way I was socialized. And I hope that we can work together to eliminate those from our speech. Okay, so to quickly recap our three experiments, practice active listening, learn from people who care passionately about what you do who are not like you, change your speech, switch up some of those defaults, see how it goes for you, and last but not least, if you see something that is suboptimal, correct gently in a spirit of love and mutual respect. So here's the really hard part. There is not a single thing that I have said to you today that is revolutionary. 
I would posit that each one of you has walked in here hearing of at least one of these experiments, if not all of them, before today. So if the experiments are simple, and we've heard about them before now, I think the bigger question is, why are we not doing it? Why are we not going through this rigorous process of self-examination? Why is this journey towards self-awareness not a, more, a greater goal in our communities? And I propose that the answer is fear. I think that we are afraid that if we begin this process, if we start down the rabbit hole, that there will be things that we see that we will never be able to unsee. We are going to realize things about ourselves that we didn't like. We are going to be ashamed of some of our behaviors. We are going to find aspects of the systems in which we operate that we consider to be absolutely unconscionable. And the fear may not be what we may discover. I think our greatest fear is that when we see these things that we cannot unsee, we will be compelled to act. And that action will be uncomfortable. It will be painful. We may lose friends. We may have to change jobs. We will have to do things that are uncomfortable. And perhaps even more frightening, if we choose to avoid that discomfort, if we choose not to act because of our fear, then we are afraid of having to reevaluate ourselves as not the good person we once thought we were. And how does that make us feel? Instead, it is easier to simply sit sometimes and do nothing. And to that, my friends, I say it's time to tear off the Band-Aid. Rip it right off. This process is going to be uncomfortable. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to embarrass yourself. You are going to make the wrong decision. You will stumble in your attempts to understand these problems and to take a look and evaluate your defaults and understand how they can be better adjusted for us all to live a better life together. And that is perfectly okay, because if the end goal, the result that we are working for, are communities, companies, and projects that are stronger, better, faster, because of the shared experience and the diversity of perspectives that come together to inform solving this problem, surely that discomfort is all worth the effort. I wish you the best of luck. Let me know how it goes. I'll see you on Twitter. Thank you.